Hey there everybody, how you doing? This is Alakai. Today we are at the Hobie Fishing Stage, presentation by Tommy Ponce. Uh, we're going to be talking about saltwater bass tactics. Pretty sure it's going to be centric around on your kayak or float tube or a little boat, but uh, he's going to go over some of the different um, things that work for him and hopefully we can get something out of it. In case you missed it, this is the Fred Hall Show Seminars. But uh, I'm just going to basically talk about mostly calico and barred sand bass. Um, I would talk a little bit more about spotted bay bass, but honestly that's not exactly my specialty. Um, I really don't target that them very much, and nor will I probably ever. Um, so let's just get to it. Uh, Alright, I, I don't know how many of you guys actually do kayak bass fishing. How, how many do we actually do? Okay, actually, quite a few. That's good. I like that. So, do you guys have any kind of troubles trying to find these bass? I mean, maybe the temperatures, structure, lack of structure? Dur during the winter. <laughs> during the winter. Winter time. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the kayak bass fishing for off the kayak. It can be challenging, but also be the most rewarding thing you can possibly do. The reason why I say that is that you can you can always find bass on a boat. It's pretty easy. Finding them on a kayak is a little challenging because you actually have to cover ground. You have to find the structure. You do have to look for those kelp patties. Those kelp patties is actually what's going to produce. Um, it's just, you got to find their home. If you don't find their home, you're not going to find them back. This is something I want to talk about. If at first you don't succeed, try doing what your guide told you to do in the first place. I learned this one in Panama. It's true. I'm a guide myself. And I don't know how many times I've told my clients to do a certain way, certain things. I'm pulling up fish and they're having just a crazy day. It, it, it's, it, I don't like seeing it, but they just won't listen. Right there. Pay attention to that quote. Um, it's something that I struggled with in Panama. Panama is a completely different breed of water, different different breed of fishing. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to have any kind of guide assistance at that time because it was actually a tournament. Um, so it was all up to yourself. But pay attention to that, especially with your guides. Listen to your guides. All right, how to find bass in your kayak. Calicos can be found pretty much anywhere in SoCal. Um, look for, you're gonna be looking for your boiler rocks, you're gonna be looking for your, 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 uh, your kelp fields, your kelp forest, and then you can find them on any of our islands that we have, any of them. Um, they do like to harbor where, wherever they were born, they don't go much further further from where they were born. They, they tend to stay and hunker down and be where they're going to be. That's, that's, just, that's just their life cycle. Um, as far as structure, structure is key to finding bass. If you don't find a structure, you won't find bass. Boiler rocks often harbor the bigger bass. They like that turbulent water. They want, they want currents running into each other. It's, it's just one of their tactics that they like to use to build an ambush. Um, strong, and, strong and turbulent uh, water is actually what you, what you want to find. Um, and then, okay. So um, when you're when you're in those those turbulent waters, you actually need to get into it. It's the best thing you can possibly do is actually just physically put your kayak into the rougher waters. You do not want to be staying outside of the rougher water. You need to get in there. The, the, that's, that's where you will find the bigger bass. Um, the reason why we do that is just more of it, you kind of want to weed out the smaller ones. You want to get into the bigger ones. The bigger ones are always going to be in the rougher, the better water conditions. Um, they're always going to look for boiler rocks and reefs with a lot of surge. Look for that surge. Look for that odd looking water that where there's calm water here and an odd looking water over there. Hopefully there's a structure pile there. Most likely there is because it's a surge. Fish that. That, that is going to be your spot. 
either work at work the bottom, work in the water column, or work the top water, depending on what the conditions give. Okay, so when you're looking for water, green water, blue water, or dirty water. This is where a lot of people struggle finding any kind of bass. And usually what it comes down to, it's more about your lure selection. Uh, your lure selection is actually what's going to be going, cutting through that dirty water. So you want, if, it, if the water is super murky, you want to get that kind of lure that has more of a, a shine to it. Now I'll show, I'll show you. Referring to shine, referring to these these blades. These blades will actually cut through that colored water that you're looking that that you're struggling with. The clearer the water, the better, obviously. Um, but when you got those murky conditions, you want to find colors that are very bright. Um, it cuts through. It, it kind of alleviates the fish from actually looking harder for the, for the bait. Um, now, mind you, this is a one ounce uh, swim bait. I mean, yeah, it's really good. Um, but, but I like to use, I don't like to use anything smaller. The reason why I don't like to use anything smaller, mainly, it, cut, it weeds out the smaller bass. There's no reason why you should use anything smaller if you want to always use a one ounce or bigger. Um, believe it or not, I don't know how many, I don't know how many bass have actually bit this lure and they were completely short, 10 inches, eight inches long, Absolutely, way absolutely nothing. Um, just want to use these bigger, bigger lures. I promise you, you will be successful. I'll get more into lures later on, um, but I just want to give you guys some kind of visual of what I was talking about. Um, weather. Weather can definitely affect fishing. Um, we all know this. This is exactly what happens. Um, as of now, the water is very dirty just because of all the, whip, the rain we've had. It's not exactly producing the best. We're kind of hunkering down at the bottom, not biting anything. They're, they're more like pretty much a part of it. Um, those bright, sunny days, we're going to experience more top water action. We're going to feed on the, on, the, on, the bait, on the bait that's coming up more on the top water. The bait's going up because the water, water, the water is warmer. Um, and then also visual aids. In a kayak, it's not exactly easy to find your fishing spots, your, land, your, your, uh, your honey holes. So what I do is I actually look on the beach or wherever I'm at, or sometimes I look at points on the coast, and I have a general idea of where I'm at. And I know exactly where I'm going to go fish just because of those landmarks. Sometimes I use a, a lifeguard station, a lifeguard tower. I'll use uh, buoys. Just I know that 100 yards south of that buoy, I know there's a rock pile over there. I don't know how many times I've gone out on a kayak with no fish finder, and I have been successful because of that. So try to utilize landmarks more, a lot more than you think you should actually use them. Um, it is, it'll definitely help you. It'll, it'll help you feel a little bit more successful. Also, it, it gives you a landmark to, to head to, uh, especially when you're starting off the day. Um, I like to think ahead of time where I'm going to go fish in, in the morning or the night before, just judging on the weather. Weather alone will make me decide where I'm going to go, especially in my home waters in Dana Point. If it's going to be super windy, I might head south, um, just, just so I can get all that, that wind out of it and then start fishing the certain rock piles and structure piles that I like to fish that I know are the best. Um, I won't target certain areas in the north if I know it's going to be crazy windy and maybe a little bit wet, mainly because I don't want to have that that resistance coming back home. So it's a long ride home you know, when it's windy and it sucks. I don't like to do it and I, I will plan accordingly, especially with my guided trips. I make sure that everybody is capable of even making these journeys, even though it's a few miles, sometimes, sometimes it's five to eight miles. I gotta make sure that you guys can actually handle that. If not, then I have to plan accordingly to what your limitations are. All 
All right. How to fast feed and live. This is actually a, this is actually a kind of an important one. This is what you need to know in order to actually find the bass that you want. You need to know how they how they feed. So, bass use structure for protection, for protection and assistance. Um, that what they do is they actually use that. You can tell by the, the color of the bass. They kind of, they blend in very well with the kelp. That is their camera. And they are ambush predators. And they are going to attack your bait. They're going to attack any kind of live bait or artificial lure. Um, they're actually very, very, very good predators. Um, and finding them, it's just basically you got to find their home. Um, the rougher the water, the better. This mainly pertains to coastal fishing. Um, bass do tend, they can live up until about 250 feet of water. You're not going to find that rough water, you're not going to find that structure pile very often. At least in, in my waters, you won't be finding that. And really, you shouldn't really need to go that deep anyways. You should just be hunkering around locally, around your local structure piles. Um, again, they have their ambush style of feeding. Use that to your advantage. Um, using that to your advantage is something that you should do with your artificial lures. The artificial lures can, if you act like a like a injured fish, uh, injured bait fish, use that. You, use it to your advantage. That, that's going to be one of your key things to do. You know, if, if it's not something, if it's not a tactic that you don't already have, then utilize it. Work, work on their weaknesses, not your own. Um, Kelp is a common place to start to search for bass. That is 100% true. Um, not all structure piles will find, you will harbor bass. Gonna, but you will find them in the kelp. That's, that's just their home, it's their natural home. Um, <coughs> temperatures and depth. Ah, okay, well temperatures. Temperatures tend to be a very vital way of finding them. I like to keep it around 65, 70 becomes a little too warm for them. They, they will become a little large, lethargic and they start going down to the cooler waters. They will attack on the top water, but they like to keep it at around that 65, 68 range. At least in my opinion, and that's what I've noticed over the years, um, that's what I've observed. Um, it's not a fact, it's not a statement, it's just what I've observed. Um, and then also aerial temperature, not temperatures, uh, air, aerial factors like clouds. Clouds is something that you actually kind of use that to your advantage. You get that that, that cloudy water, um, it changes the color of the water. That means you can play with a little bit more leaves. You don't have to just stick to just bright colors. You can actually go into darker colors and changing the pattern a lot. That's another thing with, with bass fishing is you're going to constantly change those, constantly. If you don't like it, don't try bass fishing. Just don't do it. Because that's what's going to happen. Um, and then obviously natural bait is best. That pretty much goes for all styles of fishing. There's just you can always use a throw down a sardine um, and throw it down in the bottom. Boom! Go hook up a bark sand bass. No problem. Uh, as long as there's a little bit of stru structure in the rock bottom. Um, and do, ba do bass feed all day? Sometimes. <laughs> I wouldn't say they always feed all day. It seems like they play with the tides. Um, they, it, the only way you can actually get them to feed is when, especially on like strong currents, they're burning more energy, so they will actually tend to bite more or more aggressively just because they're hungry. They're, they're fighting the current, they're doing anything they can to stay hunkered down. So your chances of actually hooking up is that's pretty good. Uh, use that to your advantage too as well. Tools of the trade. I'm getting tired of holding this thing. You guys still hear me? Okay, what I normally use, I got my Daiwa Lex up. This is my baby. Okay, Lex at 300. Okay. It'll be my go-to rig. Um, and constantly we will be changing out this lure, or this leader. This leader, this leader will be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller by the end of the day. So I usually find about two or three of these. Would you like to start with like two, three feet? Three 
Yeah, what I normally do is I'll kind of do like the length of the rod, so from rod tip to about to the um, that's, that's my starting point, and then it usually ends up to the uh, foot, um, unfortunately. But, the Baycaster is my friend. Um, I like it more, a little bit more of a stiffer rod. Um, some people like a lot of sensitivity in their in the rod tip alone. That's not my kind of game. Um, I don't really need that. It's just not something I need. I actually, I really just need the back. Um, All right. Better? Yes. Oh. Jeez. Just gave me anxiety just about holding it. All right, I feel way better now. Except this microphone's been in everyone's face all day long. It's kind of gross. Anyways. So, my Baycaster is my go-to rig. Um, I would definitely use this on a kayak all day long, but I'll also use spinners. I like using spinning outfits. That's one of my favorite tools to use too as well. You have a little bit more control with your, when you're casting, a little bit more pitch, pitchability. Um, sometimes with the baitcaster, there, there is limitations when you are casting on a kayak. Um, so, you know, there's give and take. That's why I have both, and I have many on my kayak. Um, what lures do I use to target bass, bass species? Well, this one alone. This one's called a reed bolt thrower. Um, some people have more luck than others with this thing. I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. I get to create the action as fast as I want or as slow as I want. Um, and it tends to do the work for me. Um, also, we use swim baits called persuaders, um, which, which I'll get into later on. But this is my go-to rig. Uh, not necessarily the color pattern. This color pattern in general is more for you know brighter days, super sunny, nice and clear. The, this is going to go out there, and it will get hammered. Um, there's actually a picture up there with, with a bright, sunny day with this particular lure. Um, all day long, I'm just using just one. Sometimes you get those days. Um, kayak accessories and tools needed. So, kayaking has a special, special thing. You need everything. There's so many tools that you need. So many tools that you think you actually need. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these. These are called fish grips. These are great for toothy critters. These are great for finicky bass that just won't stop slapping you in the face. This definitely gives you guys the control. Um, it gives you control. It gives you the chance to get them in the, in the live well, to put them on your on your ring. Hey, um, I've used them for sharks before. Uh, just to tame them, just so I can get a hold of them and release them. Um, sometimes it, it can be a real pain in the butt if you don't have any kind of form to, to, get, to get a hold of them. Also, you need a good, good pair of pliers. I use P-Line. These ones are old. I mean, I, I got a brand new pair at home, but for some reason I just can't let go of this one. Um, it's been on a lot of trips with me. It's been with me to Panama. It's been, it's been everywhere. Mexico. Um, I like a particular set of needle nose pliers with braid cutters got to have the brake button machine because you're always going to have brake on as your backbone. Um, as far as clothing, clothing you're always going to have some kind of protection. You, you always, I, I strongly recommend using UPF um, t-shirts. Um, for one, they'll keep you cool. It doesn't, it's kind of weird. It, it feels like you wouldn't actually stay cool, but you, got, you really do. Um, I, I struggled with it in the very beginning, but now it's like second nature. Uh, a good pair of sunglasses happen to be Hobie. Um, I do recommend a good pair of polarized sunglasses. For one, you can just see through the water, cut the glare, and see but you might be fishing water that you think has is, is got structure or file, and it turns out it's a cloud. That's not good. <laughs> so get that good pair of polarized sunglasses. You really need them. Um, as far as dry bags, dry bags I use anywhere from holding my snacks, my water, my tools, um, and even bags of lures. This is one of my go-to grab bags. What I normally do is I just have bags of, of lures that go into another bag that keeps them dry. Um, I try to keep them as clean as possible. 
so this is what I do. And anything that's, that can't get wet, like your cell phone. I mean, I, I have a case for my phone, so I'm not really worried about getting wet. But a lot of people, a lot of the guys use dry bags. Dry bags are your friend on a kayak, and, and it's definitely a, a necessity. Um, it, it will. It, I've used them for coolers. I've used them to keep extra pairs of dry clothes in there. Fortunately, sometimes you do actually flip your kayak, and then it's cold. You're wet. What do you do? You, you just stay wet or go home or strip down and put on some new fresh clothes because you had a dry bag. Um, I highly recommend always bringing at least one change of clothes or something that'll keep you warm. That just because you're wet, you put it over. Throw off all your wet clothes. Um, weather specific clothing. So obviously on a rainy day weather, you're going to be wearing your, you can either wear um, like bibs, you know, that kind of look like big old coveralls, or I like to wear in particular either board shorts or waterproof pants, and I'll wear a pair of deck boots if I, you know, if extra tough or something. Um, that, that's about as weatherproof as I'm going to get, because otherwise I get really, really hot. Some guys like to be completely bundled up and do not want one drop of water on them. Um, honestly, it cools me down a little bit. Um, otherwise, in the summertime, I'm still wearing my long sleeve shirt, shirts, but I will be wearing my board shorts. Um, and board shorts and most likely no shoes. I'll just either wear sandals or be barefoot. Um, I just don't care. I always make sure I have sunscreen on. Um, sunscreen is key. Keep, keep lathering all day long throughout the day. You'll be fine. If you're really sensitive to things, they have these things called face buffs. Put them on, cover your face as, as much as you possibly can. If you can actually, you know, handle that kind of face protection, not everybody can do it. Dudes with beards, we struggle with this stuff, and it just goes everywhere. So I don't really like using a face buff. Um, sometimes I will if it's really, really windy, and or if it's raining and it's just a little mist and it's kind of keeping my face dry. I'll put it on. I'm not happy about it, but I'll put it on. And then your Hobie fishing kayak. So, all of our kayaks, they come with rod holders, well, built in rod holders, but it's not 100% perfect. You literally have to build your, your fishing vessel to the way you actually fish. So, I always, have a, I always have a fish finder on there. I always have a bait tank on there. I have rod holders. I got all my tools. I got my snacks, my drinks. You gotta maintain all that. Um, in the kayak itself, there's really nothing crazy about it out until you actually fully deck it out. And I've seen guys on the East Coast, I don't know why, but they have to have everything. Absolutely everything, and I don't understand why. Um, I tend to be more of a minimalist. I bring one bag of lures uh, specific to my area. I don't obviously just you know, not bring stuff. Um, and I keep it that way. Some guys bring their entire taco shop with them, and I don't understand that. You use about maybe a third, maybe 10% of what you're actually using. So think about it ahead of time. That's that's key to going kayak fishing, especially when you're targeting certain species. If you have if you have wahoo lures in your tackle box, and you're going for, for calico bass. Why would you bring that? No, and, and I've seen this a thousand times. There's no need. For it. So usually when I'm guiding, I'll, I'll tell them to bring their tackle, what they what they think is you know pertinent to to their needs. And it turns out, throw it away. Here, you call my stuff. Now, this is what you're going to be using today because I know exactly what this is going to produce and this is what we're going to get. This is what you hired me for. So, using your kayak to the advantage is definitely yeah. key. Um, and then having all your gear, all your tools with you in good condition is key. Actually, there's a little bit more of the fun part. So tips, tricks, and coping situations. Now, I don't know any kayaker that has never been stuck in kelp. Uh, has anyone been stuck in kelp? Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? Well, there's actually ways to do it too, especially in a Hobie. Um, the first thing that's gonna get hung up in your Hobie is that Mirage Drive. That Mirage Drive is just gonna get buried like quicksand. There's only one way to get rid of it. Pull out your drives. Pull out your drives and let the current, let the current just keep on pushing you through. Um, that'll help you, or if you have a paddle, use your paddle, paddle out, 
get into a little bit more open water, put your drives back in, get back out. Um, that is more the more effective method. Now, a lot of guys ask me when, when they're buying kayaks, how do I anchor? I've never anchored in my, well, I've anchored maybe about 10 times in my kayak year. And I don't actually have a physical anchor. Um, I, do, I will not bring it with me. I don't, any, I don't even own one anymore. My natural anchor is actually kelp. Kelp is already anchored to the seafloor. Grab a piece of kelp, tie it onto your kayak. That is good enough for you to stay put foot and fish that, that body of water that you're trying to fish. Uh, any, anywhere from the water column, the mid water column, to the bottom, to the top water. Doesn't matter. Just use a piece of kelp. And the best part about it, undo yourself, it goes right back into the ocean, and there's a natural anchor. Um, now, how do I fish boiler rocks? Has anyone fished boiler rocks here? In a kayak? Yeah. Tried to? Okay, well this can be very dangerous, but also be very productive. Um, what I like to do, here's a good actual example. It's not really a boiler rock, but it'll give you an actual physical example. So let's just say we got waves crashing into here. Just crash, crumbling, crumbling, crumbling. That's where you want to be. It's stupid, but that's where you want to be. So, you cast it, get into castability range, and then especially with the new drives, you have that reverse. Use the reverse to your advantage. I don't know how many people just turn around their kayak and just go back to the original spot. I'm like, why? Just use a reverse. So I'll get as far, as close to there as I possibly can. You want to get in there. That turbulent water, like I said earlier, harbors the bigger bass. Get in that nasty water. But stay safe. Okay? The moment you're about two kayak, kayak lengths away, come back. Start coming back to your original spot, or if it's not being productive, move on. Turn right or left, if it's safe. Um, you really have to keep your head on a swivel, especially in areas like that. That's the only way you'll survive without flipping your kayak or losing your gear. Losing your gear tends to be very expensive. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like losing gear. It, it hurts. Um, so just be mindful. It, it, in a way, it's actually common sense, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's amazing what you think common sense should be, but it's not. Um, but, but yeah, just, just approach boiler rocks safely and use, do it efficiently. Uh, cover as much ground as you possibly can. Couple situations. So sometimes you're actually lucky and you can get rock piles adjacent to kelp. Th those are like the holy grails. That's what you, you would love to find those. Um, they don't really exist a lot where I fish, but I've seen them down south, I've seen them up north. Um, it's a little bit more productive when you get to play in those spots. Or when you go to San Clemente Island and you get to play with a whole new flavor. Um, use, those, use those spots to your advantage. Um, always, work the, always work the column, work the bottom. Um, with any kind of natural bait, um, any kind of swim bait. Uh, if they're working the top, throw a popper, throw, not, not popper, uh, Throw like a, a stick bait. Stick baits, they will annihilate these things, especially on a top water bite. I use my spinner baits. My spinner baits on top water, yes, they will sink, but I'm retrieving them. So I'm actually, I'm, const I'm just constantly in a steady, medium, like I call it like a medium retreat. So just easy, gentle. You know, keep that, it'll keep that, the flutter nice, nice and smooth, it'll, it'll weed out everything. The weed off even bait will actually stand out. So just keep that, this thing constantly moving. This is literally what's going to keep looking in the water. Look, look like in the water. Uh, warmer temps. So using warmer temps to your advantage. That's, the, that's actually where it becomes kind of unfair for the fish. Um, finding warmer water is just going to be a consistent top water bite. Um, you're going to find a lot of shorts. That's going to be majority of your day. But once you get past all those shorts, eventually a bigger one comes forward. Um, again, this is what I'm talking about. Even though you're getting shorts and you're using a bigger size lure, still keep using this thing because it will be bit by a bigger bass. Um, if I could throw a four pounder, I would, but it doesn't make sense. Uh, well, these, these tend to work, I'll get to that, but these tend to work best at like mid-column, top water. Um, I, I would never work these on the bottom. It's 
it's, it's, you got to basically troll them and suck them. Um, a retrieval method. So, I don't know if you guys are familiar with band casting. Um, that's what I call it. So basically, cut exactly. Basically, covering ground. So you're going to start at one point and at another point. Um, that's how you cover ground. That's how you figure out if a spot's going to be dead or not. Um, I like to do that method, especially in kelp fields. Um, I, I'm normally not exactly in the kelp field. I'm just outside of it. Uh, one, I don't like the hassle of dealing with the kelp. And then two, I just like the build. Again, the ambush style of feeding. I cast on the edge of the kelp. It makes it forces them to come out and bite your loop. So they're here. You're right here. You're casting right here. You're making them come out. Hence that ambush, you know, theory for them. Not theory, fact. Um, so use that to your advantage. Definitely. Um, warmer temps tends to be more spawning time. Um, they become a little bit more aggressive. They're hungry. Uh, again, if anybody's ever been any kind of freshwater fishing, freshwater bass fishing, the tactics are generally the same. The only difference is, is we're using bigger lures, bigger hooks, and especially in a kayak, you're approaching it a little bit differently. Um, you definitely got to get up into that spot. You want to be able to cast into it without spooking them too much. Uh, that's why you have that castability. Uh, keep in, I like to keep anywhere I'm going to cast at about two kayak lengths away. Especially if I'm going to, I'm going to cast far, I'm going to cast hard. I don't want just the, my sound of the lure just constantly making splashes. I don't want my kayak making, making noises but to the best of my ability. So just maintain about two lengths of castability range from wherever you're going to go. Okay, so casting. Casting methods and covering ground. This is a tricky one. This, ha this picture happens to be at San Clemente Island. That island is huge, and you are going to cover some massive amounts of ground. Um, I'm not a fan of staying in one place like, the whole time unless it is being productive. So I'm going to constantly be pedaling. So my, con my, my kayak is parallel with the island. And I'm just casting ahead of me, retrieving it, doing what I gotta do. I get a bite, I stick. Then I'll start fan casting all over again into that spot and try finding more bass. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep moving. Um, I will literally go into caves. I will, I will hug little rock piles that's right off the coast. You have to find that spot. You, you just have to cover ground. You have to put your time in, put the effort in to get anything as a reward. Uh, don't let the little shorts, you know, fool you. There's bigger ones right below them. They're kind of like the, the feeder fish. They're just gonna keep feeding, 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 and the bigger calicos are just resting and they're lazy. They're just gonna stay there until it's right here. You put it right in front of your face, they're gonna bite it. The smaller ones, they'll just they'll just keep biting the tails, to just being really annoying, really. Um, working baits and lures from top water. I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Bottom fishing tends to be a little bit boring for me. I like to create the action of the, of the baits versus just kind of bait and weight method. Um, I'm just not a fan of it. I just, I just don't like it. I, I like the act of casting. Uh, I feel more productive. I feel better about myself. Like it matters. Uh, but I do feel better. And um, sometimes it happens to be only a bottom bite and you'll figure that out quickly. Um, especially in that deeper water where I was talking about. Those deeper waters, you kind of just don't have a choice but not to work the bottom. You just got to keep huggering and then just keep pedaling and work the bottom. That lure is just going to be bouncing up and down, up and down, up and down, and eventually we'll be bit. Top water bites. Top water bites are a lot, more, a lot a little bit more of my, my style. I enjoy, like I just said, I enjoy creating the action. I enjoy actually seeing that blow up on the water. It's, it's awesome the best feeling just seeing it just get slammed. Knowing that you, you chose a lure that is going to be big. Um, that's just my favorite and it's what I live for. I don't always get to see it. Sometimes it's in the, you know, the zero to ten foot range where I'm dragging that lure down. And uh, I lost my train. Give me one thing.
But yeah, the, the, when I'm casting out up into the top water, I like to keep it as tight and in as possible, keep that line con, and just utilize the fan casting method. It will be productive. Um, <laughs> again, listen to your guide. Um, I don't really need to go too much more into that. I kind of I forgot that I wrote that in there. But still, listen to your guide. And storing your catch. Some of my clients actually want to keep the fish. Some, some. I, I don't have a big fan of killing a lot of calico. They, they take a long time to grow. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. But um, I pride on myself in preservation. So if some, if the client wants to take them, that's their deal. It's not my problem. They pay me to do this. This is what this is what they're gonna get. Um, but I, for me personally, I just prefer to throw majority of them back. Unless they're gut hooked, they're gonna die. Every now and then, I'll take one because they're tasty. I, I, I do enjoy them. Um, but other than that, storing your catch, I usually either put it in my live well. Um, I'll keep it fresh as possible until I get to the dock, and just leave it that way. Or I'll use a game hook. The game hook it just looks like a big U, kind of like a carabiner that goes through the gills, through the mouth, and you stay in the water. And they're dra they'll be dragged the whole time while you're out fishing, keeping them fresh, and until you're ready to go home. Um, that's basically what us kayakers do. It's simple. Um, I'm not a big fan of peeling them right away, because then they're kind of baking in the, in the sun, and just keep them alive. <laughs> Fun facts about bass. So calicos do not migrate. Not exactly. I said this in the beginning, but they don't migrate. They're not migratory species. Um, they will hunker down basically wherever they were born. They are pelagic spawners, but they end up towards either the islands or the coastal ground. Um, so let's just say they, they you know, they, they were born here in the rock pile, a current tucked them maybe to the other side of the show. They're most likely going to stay right there. If not, maybe come back a little bit more. That's it. So if you could somehow track these, these bass that where the spawn was at, where all these eggs were, most likely you'll find those fish that were born right there. Most likely. But they do not they do not migrate. Uh, their only migratory thing that they do is maybe move from from structure pile to structure pile. That's it. Um, this is kind of a, a semi obvious one. Bass are most high in spring, in summer months. Um, that's due to the spawn and due to the warmer waters. Um, they, they, have, they tend to have a little bit more aggressive bite. Um, they, you can kind of just damn near throw anything at them. Um, that, that's why I like about the summer months, the spring months, the warmer months. It, it just makes bass fishing a lot more enjoyable and something you know, I, I can share with my friends. Um, calicos are slow to grow. This is what I was just saying about my guides, or with my clients. They, they take about five to seven years old just to grow up to a legal size, if or about 12 inches. Um, that's a very long time. So when I see people actually taking illegals and killing them, it kind of bothers me. It's like, dude, this thing took forever to grow. And why are you taking them? Just give them a few more years and let, let them spawn, let them do what they got to do. So I heavily preach CPR, cash flow to release. Just let them go. You know, every now and then you want to take one, do it. Go for it. Just don't take the whole bag limit, you know? And, but again, this is me, not everybody is me, and you guys are entitled to do whatever you guys want to do, as long as it's legal, you have legal sizes, and abide the bag catch, or the, the bag size, which is fine. Um, minimum size catch, oh. Minimum size catch, what did I do? Oh, okay. Uh, minimum legal catch is 14. 14 inches. That's not 13 and 7 eighths. That's not 13 and 3 quarters. It is 14 inches. And that's not by pushing down on them. <laughs> you know? It has to be a legit 14 inches. Um, rulers are, you can use rulers like a, a little measuring tapes that tailors use. You know, whatever. It, 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 anything that helps. Um, so just make sure that your legal catch is legal. This one was during a tournament time. I'm only showing it because I had a board on it, and I want to, you know, make sure that you guys can actually see what I'm talking about. So just keep it at legal size, 14 inches. 
um, common depths. In my opinion, this is what I've noticed, and it's I've seen it on on fish base. They've been known to go up, to, up until about 275 feet of water. I really don't believe that. I've never seen them that deep. <laughs> but for the ones I've seen, it, they more power to them. But the most common time I see them is at zero to eight feet or 20 to 100 feet. That's what I tend to see most in Dana Point. Um, it's about the 100 foot mark, maybe a little bit deeper than that, but not much. And that's where they tend to hunker down. Um, again, kelp fields, open bodies of water, boiler rocks, surgy, surgy areas, reefs, that's where you'll find them. Uh, just look for those depths, you'll be fine. <laughs> and then also, this is, a, this is a very important one. Calico bass prefer a fishing guide from Fish Village. Just saying. They tend to be very successful, and then so you should always book your trips to fish I had to. Anyways, so I know I was talking a lot, but do I have any questions? Anybody? No? What are, what are the key things you're looking for to determine uh, the current? Thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate you checking out my video. If you have a chance, please hit like and subscribe. Comment below if you can. Let me know what I'm doing wrong or what I'm doing right, what you'd like to see more of, anything of like, like that. Um, anyways, we'll catch you next time. Take care. Bye.